Well, good morning. Um, I'm Brendan Stack, and it is the top of the hour, 10 o'clock uh, a.m., uh, United States Central Time, and I'd like to welcome all of our participants to the American Head and Neck Society Endocrine Section and British Association of Endocrine and Thyroid Surgeons joint webinar on the retrosternal goiter. Next slide, please. And these are our participants and panelists, moderators and discussants for this morning's or the, today's webinar. Next slide. It's a privilege for me to uh, share the podium uh, with all of our discussants and presenters and particularly uh, Professor Neil Tolley from the United Kingdom. Neil, uh, if you'd like to say a few words and uh, introduce your uh, BEATS president. Well, uh, hello everyone and uh, a warm welcome to my British colleagues. It's afternoon here. We're all looking very casual, but we're very much looking forward uh, to this is our third joint uh, American Head and Neck Society and BEATS uh, webinar. I'd like to introduce you all to Radu Mihai, who's the president of the British Association of Endocrine and Thyroid Surgery. Just to say a few words before we start the webinar, Radu, over to you. Thank you. On my side, I just uh, wanted to say uh, how grateful I am to everybody who made this event possible. I very much enjoy personally all these uh, joint uh, webinars with our American colleagues, and we discover that it's a lot more in common in our practice. And the choice of the topic today, it's uh, so relevant to, to on both sides. Uh, uh, therefore, I'm very grateful to everybody who will make a contribution to this, and I hope uh, a lot of the audience is made up also by the BATS members, just as much as the American colleagues. So until we see face to face, hopefully in not that far future, thank you for your contributions. And I'm really looking forward to an excellent educational uh, afternoon in England and morning in the US. Thank you so much, uh, Radu. Um, so just to review our program, um, myself and uh, Professor Tolly will be the moderators and we will be monitoring the uh, uh, comments. And so if you have questions, please use the chat function and we will try to select individual chats or we will try to summarize a group of chats to present to our case presenters. Our discussants today will be Drs. Maisie Shindo and James England, Dr. Shindo representing the AHNSES and Dr. England representing uh, his English colleagues and BEATS. Uh, we will have three cases today. Case number one will be defining and assessing the retrosternal goiter presented by Dr. Marika Russell. Our second case will be absolute and relative surgical indications uh, presented by Dr. Saba Balasabaranian. And case number three will be surgical techniques to facilitate outcomes presented by Dr. Joe Scharf. So uh, can we go ahead and uh, next slide? Just as a brief commercial announcement, uh, the American Head and Neck Society uh, uh, constitutes about 1,700 members, and about 600 members of that society are members of the endocrine section that predom predominantly practice or exclusively practice head and neck endocrine surgery. And so if you're interested in more information, our web address is posted there. Uh, next slide. And then we can go ahead and start with our presenters. Dr. Russell. All right. Good morning and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Um, so I'm Marika Russell. I am at the University of California, San Francisco. And it's my pleasure to be here with you all today. I'm going to be sharing uh, a case um, that uh, hopefully the discussion will lead to some uh, some pearls around uh, assessing uh, uh, extent of uh, uh, the substernal goiter. So this is a case of a 60 year old woman. Um, she has a slowly enlarging thyroid. It was first noticed um, about five, six years ago in 2015. 
And um, she's fairly healthy, um, but she has a history of cerebral palsy and uh, she has some cognitive delay. She's actually cared for by her aging mother still and requires some uh, hands-on on care on a, on a regular daily basis. Um, so she's been followed for her thyroid by her primary care provider, as well as endocrinology with serial ultrasounds. And most recently, um, she was noted uh, to have a dominant nodule on the right side. Uh, it's heterogeneous. It's got some macro calcifications and a non-suspicious uh, pattern, um, but it's grown about two centimeters over the last two years. Um, she has a similar looking nodule on the left side, uh, but smaller. And she has had an FNA of both nodules, which showed benign thyroid nodule. So she's actually fairly asymptomatic. Um, she doesn't report her history very easily, um, but she denies any dysphonia, dyspnea, dysphagia. Um, and she does have, um, she recently developed a cough. And so um, her primary care provider in light of her recent cough obtained some chest imaging. And so what you see here is a uh, coronal view of the chest film, it's a non-contrast uh, CT. And you can see that she's got this large goiter predominantly on the right side. You can see evidence of the macro calcifications here. Um, and then you see its extent uh, nearly to the aortic arch. And then on axial view, you can see here this large uh, thyroid nodule. We're at the level of the clavicles. You can see that the airway is compressed and deviated to the left. And then even a bit lower, we're behind the sternum and we still see the bulk of this nodule here and the compression of the airway here. Um, but I'll point something else out, which is fairly interesting on this uh, exam, which is that here we are at the sternum and we're seeing her mandible here. Um, and so she looks to be in a very flexed position and in fact, she is, this is the scout film from her chest CT. So her arms are raised and in raising her arms, her neck has become fairly flexed. And so she's been recommended to undergo surgery by endocrinology. And the thought here is that um, she's got some compression of her airway. The nodule has grown a fair bit in the last couple of years. She requires care from her mother who's aging and now is probably the best time to do this. And so I, I think I'll, I'll stop and maybe see if there are any questions about um, the workup so far, or what you would propose for this patient. Thyroid function tests. So sure, thyroid function studies are normal. I don't know if anybody else wants to make a comment, but uh, I would like to look at the ultrasound as well. Yeah, so I didn't include a, uh, an image there, but it does, it has a, a low suspicion pattern. It's heterogeneous. There are some, it's predominantly solid, some areas of cystic uh, change, um, some areas that appear spongiform, and then these areas of macro calcification, but no suspicious features on the, um, on the ultrasound. Marika, does the patient have a fixed flexion deformity of her neck? Or she does generally? not. She does not. And so I can tell you that when I saw her in clinic, I was able to get her to extend. And one of the things that I look for when I'm seeing patients with retrosternal extension is whether or not in extension, I can get my finger around the edge of the nodule. Um, and in her case, I felt that I could. Um, and the other um, aspect of the exam that I, I feel is important is um, on ultrasound, when I slide my probe down, if I can get to the bottom of the nodule before the clavicle obstructs the view, then I feel pretty confident that I can get to this fairly easily. Um, so and a, very, a very simple question. What is the rationale for advising this lady has surgery? Yeah, so it, it wasn't a slam dunk for me either. Um, the idea was that it's grown. Um, she's at a point in her life where she can be cared for by her mother. Her, she's in her, she's 60. So her mother is at least in her eighties. If she's going to have surgery, it's probably best to do it now while her mother is able to care for her. And, um, but I agree with you. It wasn't, she's asymptomatic. The other question was, you know, does she, is she really unable to um, vocalize any of her symptoms? She does have some cognitive delay and she, you know, she's, she's present, but she, she doesn't really articulate very easily any of her complaints or symptoms. 
Um, so are we missing something uh, is one question. Um, are we worried about the continued um, likelihood of growth? And third is, you know, now our window of time before it continues to grow. And so that was the recommendation for, for removal, the rationale behind the recommendation. Um, so Marika, Marika, uh, for all of those who uh, know our section, Greg Randolph, our, our recent former chair of the section, raised his hand and I think he had a comment. Greg, are you on? No, I, I do not. I do not have any comment. Okay. Thank Okay, I saw your hand raised. Okay, thanks. And then the other, other, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to make a couple of comments about um, why we look at the ultrasound. Because um, I always encourage people to look at the ultrasound imaging because uh, it's not uncommon that, you know, biopsy is done of a dominant nodule that's visible. But if you don't look, there may be a smaller nodule posteriorly, especially in these big, large goiters that could actually be suspicious. Uh, that they did not target. And I've seen that. Uh, right. In fact, not that long ago, we had exactly a similar case and we targeted the more posterior suspicious lesions um, that was really deep that you can't get a great look. But it, if you look hard enough, it's, there was something there and that turned out to be, uh, but there's a five, mm -hmm. uh, which then really changed our you know, decision-making. Um, and and the, other, the other reason to do the ultrasound, at least look at the ultrasound is exactly what you talked about, which is, do I really, can I really tell what the inferior extent of this is on ultrasound? And then, then if not, then, you know, we would get a cross-sectional imaging. This was a little bit different in that they, they, um, they just went ahead and, you know, got a cross-sectional imaging. Right. So. And, and I agree with you, Maisie, on the need for ultrasound. And I do ultrasound in all of my patients. And in this case, I was not, not concerned by the appearance. It was a single dominant nodule uh, on the right side. Um, and so I, I guess another question is whether or not uh, anyone would offer this woman, assuming we're going to move towards surgery, whether anybody would recommend a total or simply a right hemithyroidectomy. Marika, do you mind if I just ask you about informed yeah. consent uh, sure. for this type of surgery? Um, these patients often have short necks and, and, and they are more difficult operations. And what, what sort of um, risk do you do you apportion to total thyroidectomy or thyroidectomy in these type of patients? So that's the first question I'd like to ask you. And also, I'd like to ask you about the setting of when you feel that you may not be able to extricate this from a, a pure cervical approach. You may need sort of cardiothoracic expertise to assist you. And right. should you also always do this type of surgery where there is cardiothoracic expertise at hand? So there are three questions in one there. Sure. Um, so in terms of risk, um, I mean, I, you know, I always counsel the patients regarding, regarding risk to, the, to, to nerves. This is benign disease. So if I had loss of signal, if I were planning for a total, which in this case I did not, but if I were planning for a total, I would of course stage the procedure if there were loss of signal. Um, I know we're going to talk a little bit later about some um, maneuvers uh, to get these large uh, goiters out from under the sternum. And in some cases that can risk placing tension on the nerve um, and, and risk of, there's risk of a stretch injury. Um, so I, I counsel patients ab about that risk. Um, the uh, need for a cardiothoracic surgeon so uh, in this case, I was actually fairly convinced that I was not going to need a cardiothoracic surgeon. Um, there are instances where I'm not entirely sure. And if I have a, you know, as much as a 10% uh, concern for needing thyroid or, or cardiothoracic surgery, I will plan to have them available. Um, in this case, I was performing this surgery at a site where I do not have regular cardiothoracic coverage available. And I made the decision uh, to go ahead anyway and not bring her to a site where I had cardiothoracic surgery available um, because I was actually so confident that um, I could get this thing out of the neck. Her, her imaging, although it looks worrisome, is really, she's in a, you know, arms up in an, in an uh, flex position and that, you know, can push the goiter down into the uh, thoracic inlet. I was very comfortable in the clinic with her in extension feeling like I was going to be able to get this out through a, through a transcervical approach. Um, I think you had three Marika, questions uh, answer too, but uh, yes. Uh, Marika, a couple questions from the chat function. Uh, 
as we're nearing a uh, time to end the case, uh, one uh, point that was raised is anyone using a micro debrider for these cases. Another point was the value of having the next CT perform with the arms down as opposed to arms up for the reasons that you just mentioned. And the third point that was raised uh, among the comments was the uh, rationale given this patient and given that there was uh, one side that was larger than the other, just uh, if you were going to do surgery, just planning on doing a lobectomy as opposed to even considering a total thyroidectomy. Uh, is there any comments that you'd like to make or any comments or discussions would like to make to those points? Sure. I mean, I can say that I've never used a micro debrider. I presume to decompress the nodule. I, um, I try to keep the capsule uh, intact for these cases because it's really critical to be able to get tension on the nodule and pull it up out of the thoracic inlet if, if that's what needs to be done. And once you lose tension on the nodule, on the, if you have a rupture of the capsule or an, uh, uh, you know, an, an incision into the capsule, um, I think you risk um, having that tool at the, your disposal. Um, in terms of the, the plan for, uh, total versus hemi, I, I did do, a, I intended to just do a right lobectomy. The other side did not appear to be contributing to her compression. It had no, um, concerning features on ultrasound. The biopsy was benign. And so I did not feel that I needed to, uh, uh involve or per, uh, perform a total. I also wanted to, uh, to avoid the need for, um, post-operative, um, uh, thyroid hormone supplementation, um, if we could do that. Um, and I don't know if there was another question I could get to, but I know we're pressed for time. So I, I'll just finish up the case. Um, she, so she underwent a, in an uncomplicated right thyroid lobectomy. It came out very easily. Um, and I did, as I mentioned, not involve the thoracic surgery team in this case. Um, I wanted to just briefly touch on, um, one, one paper that, uh, Neil led a number of years ago. This um, was a review of about 34 papers, over 2,600 patients with retrosternal goiter. Um, what was noted was, of course, there are many definitions of retrosternal goiter, as we're all familiar with, um, sometimes inconsistent. Um, and uh, what they found was that um, looking at these cases, the uh, extent of goiter, the extent of extension um, beneath the sternum was uh, associated with increased risk of complications, so complications associated with the goiter itself, um, and that the need for an intrathoracic approach um, was really associated with the uh, extension to or below um, the level of the aortic arch. Um, and so they proposed this uh, classification system, um, grade one through three, and you can see that uh, a, a goiter that extends to uh, above the aortic arch can be addressed through a cervical, transcervical approach, whereas one that extends below the aortic arch will require a um, typically um, a, a manubriotomy or what we call a mini sternotomy. Um, and anything extending below the level of the pericardium would warrant a full sternotomy, but a full sternotomy is otherwise not necessary as uh, I think many of us are, are aware. Marika, can I make a comment on that paper? I do have a big concern about a number of these papers because actually when you look at them, mm -hmm. the evidence is gained from large series from surgeons who say this patient needed a stenotomy not we attempted to remove the goiter and failed and therefore we're actually going on opinion rather than actually of course evidence. of course and there's and there's so much variability that goes into these decisions and of course the availability even of a thoracic surgery team may impact uh, a surgeon's decision to uh, to include them as as i did in this case not having availability um, so yes, I agree. It's problematic. And one of the challenges of studying retrosternal goiter is the, the lack of consistency in how we identify, how we define. And, I mean, the big, uh, well, the big concern with this, Marika, is the message we're potentially giving people is that any goiter that goes the aortic arch requires a manubriotomy. And right. we, we all know that that's not the case in right. more or less every goiter. Um, it's, it's a slight concern. Right. And my approach is always to try first. And, and uh, as many of you all know, uh, if I, I, it's very rare that I'll require a sternotomy. The consistency of the gland also impacts the ability to get it out, right? And so that ultrasound yeah. is very helpful in that regard too. I can tell sort of when I'm pressing on the, on the gland with the probe, how soft it is, whether or not it's going to be mobile, whether or not I think it's going to slide up. Um, and that uh, informs my, my decision as well to include. I, I think palpation is a really important part. You're mm -hmm. right. Um, I think if it feels really soft, you know, most of the time, 
um, you're going to be able to deliver that for the most part. Yeah. Okay. Marika, you did a great job. Thank you so much. And sure. uh, you, you covered your time great, uh, wonderfully. Uh, so now it would be time to transition to keep our pace to case two. Uh, and uh, Dr. Saba, uh, you're going to be talking about absolute and relative surgical indications for goiter surgery. And uh, the time is yours, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Neil, and my American colleagues for asking me to uh, talk. It's a great pleasure to be here. So I'm going to be talking about a case we did a few years ago. Um, the patient had a significant complication. So there's me uh, having my laundry. I'm sure James uh, would love to have a go. So uh, there we go. So just to um, give context to my American colleagues, there's the UK map, and I live and work in Sheffield in here, right in the middle of the country. And uh, uh, you may know that the Derbyshire neck or the Derby neck has been described for, uh, um, for a few hundred years. And that is because of a high prevalence of retrosternal goiter uh, in the county of Derbyshire, which is next to Sheffield. Sheffield borders in the Peak District, which is uh, basically the county of Derbyshire. And a number of reasons have been postulated as to why we have a much higher prevalence of goiter compared to the rest of the UK. Some of it uh, is from uh, a low um, iodine content in the soil. Also in the Peak District, there's a lot of limestone rock and that apparently reduces the availability of volatile iodide. It's trapped uh, as iodate. And there's this theory that uh, there might be a genetic predispos predisposition as well in that there are probably more taste blind people in this region. And by that, I mean people who don't, um, uh, who don't taste the bitterness of brassica vegetables, which are goitrogenic. And apparently this contributes to the higher incidence as well. So that's a short introduction to where I work. So we had this 87 year old lady who had a long standing goiter. See, she said since her teenage years, and she was referred to endocrinology following incidental detection of a goiter in the chest on a CT scan. The exact reason for the CT wasn't very clear. But on questioning, uh, this wasn't incidental at all in that she was quite symptomatic. And there were a number of symptoms that I've listed on the screen that she reported when specifically asked about her quality of life and her day-to-day -day living. So I think this is an important point for uh, trainees and residents in that it's not a binary whether somebody is symptomatic or asymptomatic. And often there is a spectrum. And most of the patients that we see electively in the clinic fall in the spectrum between truly asymptomatic and obviously the patients presenting with strider to the a &E. <clears throat> So this lady had quite a few medical conditions, hypertension, previous TB, and a slightly scarred lung fracture, ne neck of femur, neuropathy, and also a meningioma on conservative management. She had been started on carbimazole, uh, which I think um, is the same as methimazole that you use in the US for hyperthyroidism. She um, stopped the carbimazole herself, um, you know, just points to her uh, independent um, nature. And at the clinic, she was quite comfortable, no strido. Um, there's an obvious goiter on examination, but the Pemberton sign was negative. So here um, are a few slices of the CT scan, um, and you can see that the goiter is going down into the chest, primarily from the left side, and going behind the trachea as well, going behind the trachea and the esophagus from the left lobe, extending down into well into the posterior mediastinum. And the connection between the left lobe and the retrosternal goiter uh, was a bit narrow. And a couple more scans showing the goiter was going down to below the lower level of the aortic arch. And the tip of the goiter was just beyond the carina. So some um, coronal and sagittal views showing the same thing. The concern for me was this extension into the posterior mediastinum and also the crossover of the goiter from the left lobe uh, into the right side of the chest. And almost playing the space between the trachea and the esophagus. So, oh dear, give me a second, sorry about that. <clears throat> 
Right. So the initially the hyperthyroidism was managed with carbamazole. There were some discussions about radioiodine, but th that did not happen um, due to concerns about the risk of strider. Um, and so medical management continued for almost a year before she was re-referred for a further opinion due to worsening of her compressive symptoms. So I guess uh, I have a question for the panelists, if I may, as to the role of radioiodine in the setting. Does that, in addition to treating the toxicity, address compressive symptoms as well? And um, uh, what's your uh, you know, opinion on this? And perhaps the other question you might have is, should surgery have been offered at the stage? So when she came back to see me in a year, we had some detailed discussions with the patient and the next of kin, who happened to be uh, an intensivist in a nearby hospital. We talked about the risks of surgery, including stenotomy. And I was a bit concerned about the goiter going beyond the carina, uh, crossing over from left to right, and also extending between the trachea and the esophagus, as I showed on the scan. We talked about the risks of uh, continuing conservative management. And uh, I emphasize that the primary indication for surgery here would be to address the symptoms and improve quality of life. And therefore, um, I explained to the patient that it was really down to her because she is the best judge of her symptoms and quality of life um, as to whether she wanted to go ahead with the operation. Questions here um, would be other, um, other options other than surgery, such as microwave ablation or RFA. I'm aware that there are reports on this, even for retrosomal goiters, but I don't, uh, we don't um, have any experience of that. And the other question is, should the likelihood of stenotomy uh, influence the decision to operate, especially in an octogenarian? Uh, over 10 years ago, we wrote a piece in the annals of our English college, where we had a debate between ourselves and our Newcastle colleagues as to whether surgery should be done in an asymptomatic retrosternal goiter. Um, arguments in favor of surgery, um, as uh, explained by our Newcastle colleagues, would be that you know, many are not truly asymptomatic. There's always a risk of malignancy. Doing an operation might prevent an airway emergency in the future, and that an operation can be done safely with very minimal morbidity in experienced hands. On the other hand, you could say that the natural history of these goiters are largely indolent. You could uh, argue that the risk of cancer in a retrosome goiter is largely the same as a cervical goiter, and these are mainly good prognosis differential thyroid cancers. And in real life, complication rates um, in surgery for retrosomal goiters are much higher than those for um, goiters confined to the neck. Also in some endemic regions, you will find that retrosomal thyroid tissues are quite a common occurrence in the elderly. And the thing to emphasize again is what is considered asymptomatic may not turn out to be so on close questioning and a detailed discussion of the patient. So we proceeded to surgery. This is around 15 months after her initial presentation with compressive symptoms. And this is what we did. We, well, I call it a laparotomy cervicotomy, which means a really long incision in the neck, wide mobilization of subplatysmal flaps. Um, we opened up the character sheet and confirmed vagal function on both sides, divided the strap and isthmus very early on, mobilized the upper pole, and in this instance, I decided to do the right side first, just to get more space in the neck. In the neck. Uh, surgery as anticipated was quite difficult. Um, after the right side was done, we went on to the left side, continued the dissection down to the root of the neck. And at this stage, unfortunately for us, the cervical and retrosternal components got disconnected. And I was left staring down at the tip of the iceberg. Um, we had a thoracic surgeon, you know, we had thoracic surgery in-house, and I usually have a thoracic surgeon on standby for such cases. And the question now is, is this time to open the chest? Um, any any uh, comments on, on this um, at this stage? Uh, yes, Sabah, I think you're a very brave man. Uh, this is an 88-year-old woman, and she arguably had symptoms, whether they were due to her thyroid or for her to be, or due to her being 88 or open to debate. 
that's incredibly difficult um, retrosternal thyroid. I think we'd probably all agree with that. Um, you could have looked at giving her radio iodine, which can shrink the goiter by 20%. I know there's a theoretical risk of stride or as a result of that. Um, to actually go for surgery is, is, you know, I take my hat off to you. Um, personally, I think there's a massive difference in an operation through the neck and an operation on an 88-year-old that involves a stenotomy. Um, and whether or not you do a stenotomy is often it depends on how you put the operation to the patient. If you say to a patient, you have a tumour in your chest that we need to remove, they will be very happy to undergo a stenotomy. If you say you have a benign thyroid swelling in your chest that probably won't cause you a significant increase in symptomatology over the next five years, you've already lived beyond your expected life span. You probably wouldn't say that. Um, they probably wouldn't want you to open their chest. Um, personally, I'd bail out and then consider giving a radio iodine subsequent. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Thank you. I was, I was expecting you to say that. Uh, somebody apparently did say to this lady that uh, she'd probably die of something else than the goiter giving her problems. We did have some very long discussions with her, with her and her nephew, who was the intensivist, and he and the patient were of the opinion that her quality of life was getting really bad um, with difficulty in walking around, becoming breathless, and so on and so forth. Right, so the thoracic surgeon who was with me and um, was desperately keen to avoid a stenotomy, so was I. And there's a fair bit of bleeding from the retrosternal component. So we couldn't, um, you know, bail out. So the bit of ex um, excessive sternal traction, retraction, we're trying desperate measures like the foley and the spoon. And you offer the foley and the spoon in such situations, the nurses and the uh, anesthetists know uh, they get uh, panicky. They know what's happening, what's going to come. And using some large hemostats and babcocks to grasp the retrosternal component we've managed to pull it out. But we lost signal on both the vagus nerves, okay. complete loss of signal. Mm -hmm. The recurrent laryngeal nerves were completely intact. We could see it right from the root of the neck up to the entry into the larynx, but we lost signal. So we ended up with a tracheostomy and a feeding tube. And she, she rehabbed quite well. She's quite a stoical lady. And then I think a lot to, uh, has to be said in her determination to get back to how she was in the independent living and so on. The track key fell out in a few weeks and, and, and she didn't need it again. And the feeding tube was removed in a few months. There's complete return of voice and cord mobility and she didn't have significant hypoparathyroidism. She's doing well now, she's 91. I called her yesterday and said, I'm gonna talk about you. Uh, she was thrilled. Um, and she said, well, difficult few weeks, but I, I'm glad I had the operation. And she's keen to see a copy of these slides, right? So when things go well and you're up in the clouds, you're reminded, I'm reminded of a quote by my mentor, some of you might know. Better to be lucky than good supper. So we've got to be careful. So in summary, in terms of indications for surgery in a retrosternal goiter, all I can say is that stridor is an absolute indication and everything else is relative. You've got to consider the symptoms, quality of life, progression. We didn't jump on her and operate. You know, she, was, she was with us for a year on carbimazole, doing well, but there's quite a bit of nervousness about giving her radio iodine. Um, and then obviously general health, um, you've got to consider the risk of stenotomy and its impact. And finally, you know what the patients obviously think and want. Thank you very much for listening. Any, any um, more questions? Can I ask you, Sam, did you use continuous or intermittent nerve monitoring with this patient? Uh, uh, intermittent. We've tried the continuous before, uh, Neil, but uh, we just routinely use the intermittent. Because I think it's a, it's a beautiful indication for continuous nerve monitoring, this type of problem. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. Very good. Well, we still have a few more minutes that we can talk about this case. So uh, do our discussants have any questions or any points that they'd like to raise? Yeah. So did, when you lost signal, um, 
did you automatically just decide to trach her because you lost signal or did you actually extubate this patient and then take a look at the cords? Uh, Cause you know, you can lose signal um, because of malpositioning of the tube. So when I lose signal for any reason and the nerve is completely intact, obviously you, you have to suspect, it, did, is there something going on below the, you know, as it looped around below the arch or below the subclavian where we may have disrupted it. Uh, and that's obviously a theoretical, you know, possibility, but, um, you know, yeah. could you extubate, take a look with the scope and then trach at that point in time? Yeah. Uh, or yeah. futz with the tube, which I've done, um, and then, you know, got a signal back, for example. Yeah, yeah. So, so I just kept it really brief for the, for, for the sake of for this presentation, but uh, we went through uh, all of the motions, we waited for a fair bit, we repositioned the tube, and looked at, made sure she wasn't um, uh, uh, under muscle relaxants. And um, uh, just both sides, the signals um, uh, went at one stage when we had just about pulled the last bit out. And um, we didn't, in her case, want, uh, wanted to risk um, you know, trying extubating. It's quite a difficult operation. So we thought we'll do an elective, safe trache. And uh, we had wonder of this possibility. And um, one her and her nephew, who's next of kin, and uh, um, well, that's what we decided to do. Uh, you're right. Um, I mean, it turned out to be a transient uh, paresis. Uh, you know, she um, probably didn't need the trachea for, um, uh, for a few weeks. But postoperatively, um, there wasn't a good enough uh, moment of cords. That's why um, um, my ENT colleagues continued uh, with the trachea and said that we should send her home and bring her back again. But uh, at home, uh, we just fell out and she was fine. Um, so, so, yeah. So, so just stepping back a little bit, you know, because uh, your talk was on, you know, should you or should you not operate? Um, and so my, my sort of thought, pro I find every reason not to operate on this age group if I don't have to. Um, and so, you know, I kind of go through this list of, well, could there be something else that could be causing these symptoms? Uh, you know, I might look at uh, a swallow study to make sure they don't have a soft yield just motility, for example, that is the etiology rather than a compression. Um, you know, get a cardiovascular assessment to make sure it's not cardiac rather than this, this that's causing, you know, in this gauge, they can have shortness of breath for a lot of different reasons. So I, I don't know, I, I personally try to <laughs> find Avoid, yeah. every reason I, mean, I can. Um, yeah, we do have quite a few patients we, we monitor and don't operate. This lady was with us for a year and a bit, and she'd seen the respiratory and the cardio guys. Uh, uh, things were just not getting better, and uh, and therefore um, uh, and then therefore that's a decision we took. Now the thing about the uh, loss of signal on both sides is after we'd done the right thyroidectomy, the right lobectomy, the signal was uh, intact in the vagus. When we went back into the left side and uh, did they remove the left lobe and then um, there was a stair and the disconnection uh, from the thoracic part. At that stage, there was signal on both sides. And then it's only when we went to fetch this intrathoracic component that was between the trachea and the esophagus, it were, I think um, it was adherent to the nerve on both sides. And we had to do a fair bit of dissection from both the left and the right uh, to extricate this. And that's when uh, we were convinced that um, uh, there was pull on both of the recurrent laryngeal nerves. So um, it is right at the end that we uh, saw where we realized that we lost signals on both sides. Um, so so uh, that is the problem. The one caution um, that I always make to, to my trainees is that some of these really retrosternal, posterior retrosternal goiters, and maybe Joe is going to talk about this, but is that you can have this sort of like one component that's pedicled, which is which then extends posteriorly, um, and that's that. Sometimes the nerve can actually be coursing Theory. ventral yeah. to it, um, and I, I have actually a great slide of that that demonstrates that. And so I always think about that going in, you know, and um, but just some pearls, I guess. Yeah, the other Point thing. Maisie. Sorry, Brandon. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead, James. And okay. then uh, after your comment, then we're going to need to transition to the next. 
I mean, I was just going to say uh, an 88 year old lady would have a fairly low respiratory requirement. And um, I think you were dealt a fairly difficult hand there, Saba, not just being pushed into doing that operation, but also potentially your ENT colleagues going and tracheostomizing early. Um, I would have thought in that situation it would have been reasonable to have left the lady intubated overnight and extubate her and see how she does. Because even with bilateral reduced vocal cord mobility, an 88 year old can often have sufficient respiratory reserve to function adequately and avoid a tracheostomy. Excellent point, James. So uh, thank you everybody for your participation up to this point. Now uh, it's time for us to do our third case and I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Joe Scharf. And Dr. Joe Scharf and Marika Russell are the chair and co-chair respectively of the American Head and Neck Society Endocrine Section uh, Committee for Professional Education. And so they will continue their involvement on our subsequent webinars throughout the next two years. So Joe, do you wanna go ahead and switch your slides. Sure. It is so wonderful to see uh, so many friends, colleagues, trainees. Um, I have a case I've been asked to talk about for the surgical strategies. I think it will certainly uh, be a little bit provocative, but a little bit controversial, and it certainly generate some discussion. I want to thank the HNS and the British Society for the opportunity today. Um, I'll go right to the case. It's a 68-year-old gentleman, a tax attorney. He was in good health. He was having difficulty breathing uh, when he first presented to me in 2012, in 2012. Uh, he had been worked up for asthma, didn't have any significant past history, no radiation. His physical examination had normal true vocal cord movement on scope examination. He did have strider, uh, no lymphadenopathy, did not really have much significant thyroid enlargement in the neck, and he was euthyroid on his lab values. His uh, chest x-ray will show you a mass that's right here in this location, pushing uh, the trachea over, compressing it, and coming about down to the carina level. Uh, we further worked him up with cross-sectional imaging, and as I go through these images, um, as I said, there was very little in the neck, but as it started to progress in the retrosternal region, you could see the issue of his strider uh, with the uh, trachea being compressed in the esophagus. As we continued further and further down, you could see the brachiocephalic vein coming over into the superior vena cava, and it continued to go down quite low all the way to a point just above the carina, consistent with uh, the, the chest X-ray. Um, surprisingly, because he was a tax attorney, he didn't want to have anything done until tax season was over. And so um, we, we um, waited a, a couple of months for his care. But I, I guess I'll throw out a question right off in the beginning. This has been brought up a little bit to the uh, discussants. Would an FNA be warranted? Is it potentially dangerous in someone like this? How are you going to FNA this transtracheally? Mm -hmm. EBUS? <laughs> Uh, so, so we do ultrasounds also. Um, we, we did do an FNA. There was a little component that was coming up into the neck and the needle coming down in this area. Um, the FNA showed suspicious for a follicular neoplasm. Um, and so, you know, at that point, um, you know, we did have a little tissue to go at, you know, in terms of the case. And so looking at this case, you know, from a surgical approach, uh, we've talked about this in some of the other really nice cases that have been presented. Would uh, the discussants or panelists think about doing a lobectomy or, uh, you know, consulting for possibly a total thyroidectomy in this type of case, knowing that there's some potentially higher risk with the total? I'd certainly go for a lobectomy if I was going to operate on this guy. Um, as far as the FNA goes, um, in the absence of red flag symptoms, I wouldn't normally look to sample the retrosternal goit. Okay. So I think, you know, the decision making would be obviously start with the hemi, but, you know, a lot of these patients, you know, they may have already had a molecular testing sample held. And this may be one where you could, and, and I, I'm not an advocate of this because this needs to come out because uh, the patient is symptomatic. But in terms of decision making on whether you would just sort of automatically plan for a total if perhaps this patient had a mutation, you know, that is highly suspicious for a malignancy um, and assuming that, you know, you don't 
lose signal after removal of this side. So this is just one of those rare situations where the molecular testing potentially could guide your extended surgery. But I agree with James that right hemithyroidectomy to start would be, you know, what I would offer. And this particular case does back date back to 2012 when a firm or you know just came out. We weren't really doing quite as much molecular testing, but a very good point, certainly. So uh, this has been touched upon a little bit as we go into some of the surgical strategies, but how much of the thyroid is in the neck? How much is in the chest? Is there a handle, the location anterior versus posterior, and then the shape of the gland? And this is not the same patient, but two other patients of mine, just to illustrate a point that's been made by many others at times. These that are more of an hourglass configuration, although look a little bit more intimidating, are certainly a lot easier than dealing with these issues, which Dr. Shindo was talking about, where there might be just a small component in the neck with a tenuous uh, touching of the retrosternal component. So you would know from a surgical standpoint that this is probably going to be a much more difficult situation to deal with than a patient of that nature. And so coming back to my own patient and the case study here, I was actually able to remove it completely transcervically with the thoracic team. They're on standby. We have a very busy thoracic service. Unfortunately, they're always willing to be available for us if needed. Um, to begin with the strategies, the airway management is very, very important. Being present during the airway management, using nerve monitoring tubes placement to uh, make sure that the, the anesthesia team is uh, well prepared. And then from the surgical strategy, some of these points have been touched upon, but you can consider dividing the isthmus early, a strong consideration for dividing the strap musculature. I often look to get any points on the board where I can. And so starting superiorly to open the cricothyroid space, protect the superior laryngeal nerve and start to devascularize the gland helps a lot. Once I do that, I start to really work on the perithyroid sheath and try to move the soft tissue off of the gland so that you're putting the nerve into a predictable location in the tracheoesophageal groove because you don't want to pull straight up on the gland and stretch the nerve or put traction on it. And then as that starts to happen, um, you can start to divide some of the vessels as they enter the capsule. Sometimes you can use surgical sponges or Raytex to fill in grooves to give you support so it doesn't slide back into the chest and then freeze your hands for other areas. The multidisciplinary team is critical, not just for opening the chest, but also if you ever got in a situation where you had uh, bleeding from perhaps that uh, inferior thyroid vein branches, the brachiocephalic vein, you don't want to have a hemothorax and not have your thoracic team available for you. The nerve monitoring, I think, is very critical for these patients. Parathyroid is harder to preserve, and so there should be a very liberal plan to auto transplant if there's any question on the viability of the parathyroid glands. And so this is not that same patient, but as I was saying, you do not wanna be looking for the nerve up in this area. You want to put the nerve, which is down here into a predictable location by um, being uh, systematic in a caudad to cephalad direction to free all this before you deliver it up into the neck so that you don't risk stretching that nerve and creating problems. Um, when I work with the thoracic doctors, if we think we're going to do a thoracic approach, it doesn't necessarily always have to be a sternal split. You can start with a, a double lumen tube and you can position the patient for a video assisted thoracotomy approach, mobilize the gland and use a push pull fashion where the thoracic surgeons are going in from the chest with the VATS procedure. Um, I put this last point here for considering Valsalva movements. I've had some serendipitous events where I was struggling at times getting these out and the patient would wake up and cough and buck. And some of those changes in pressure have helped as well to help give a push to the gland to bring it up into the neck itself. So if you're going to perform a lobectomy, as we talked about, and this, this is pretty important for any thyroid, I think, not just a, a, a goiter, be flexible in the approach. A lot of engagement with the patients we've talked about. Be willing to ask the question intraoperatively. If you haven't done molecular testing, if you don't know if it's cancerous, interrogate the tissue, look for grossly abnormal nodes, test with frozen section. And then I think this is very important because the initial treatment's really not over until the final pathology returns. And so we did a lobectomy on this patient and the final pathology actually showed it to be a 10 and a half centimeter papillary thyroid cancer, no NG lymphatic invasion, no extra thyroid invasion, five nodes were negative, 
Um, and we brought, her back for a, brought him back for a completion thyroidectomy. Um, it was negative for malignancy, uh, uncomplicated. Um, to um, kind of go on just a little bit further with this patient's course, he had done quite well for a couple of years, although his thyroglobulin was rising. And um, we ended up uh, ultimately getting a PET CT scan on him in 2015, and he had uh, a bony metastasis into the sternum here, and you could see it, the bone edge around it. And so, you know, at this point in time, you could see all of the thyroid has been removed without recurrence there. We didn't have any evidence for other areas of recurrence in the patient. Creates a bit of a difficult situation here in terms of thinking what to do with this very active, healthy, younger gentleman. Um, and so I see what maybe the rest of the team, if anyone has uh, run to a situation like this or what they would do here. James, do you want to make any comments? Um, well, I would probably treat that with local radiotherapy. Um, yeah. I mean, you have radio iodine, but, uh, you know, probably local radiotherapy is the area. I guess I would we talk just, to the thoracic colleague to see, you know, mm -hmm. if this is what's the morbidity from resecting this, right. for example. Um, so he it was felt, felt to be radioactive iodine uh, refractive. We talked about many different options. Uh, we talked with our thoracic colleagues and we actually decided to uh, resect that, um, the sternum and, and the manubrium. I rotated a bilateral pectoralis flap reconstruction over it and uh, he received external beam radiation therapy uh, to that area. Uh, we, we were concerned that we weren't going to get good local regional control with uh, just external beam radiation alone. Um, just as I finish up the last couple of slides, just to give you a sense of where his course has gone, he's actually done very well. He's been, um, in, in some circumstances, he's been very active, had a very good quality of life, but he has had other metastases to liver, uh, adrenalectomy, some other bone mets that have been treated with uh, SBRT and a calvarial met in, in 2020. This film is just taken from this past month uh, where you can see the uh, bone resection without evidence for recurrence in the area. And so it certainly is a, it's been a complicated case. We're collecting all tissue every time for molecular interrogation and the use of perhaps TKIs or other targeted therapy for him. Um, so just, you know, everybody, um, uh, does surgery a little bit differently. Uh, I guess I can throw out some, a couple of comments about how, um, I kind of go through the process. You know, the first thing is, I don't know about, uh, all of you, but it, there's always sort of this sort of discussion that occurs between, uh, us and, and the anesthesiology colleagues. So some are very comfortable working you know, with me in a center. And so they don't bat an eye in terms of orotracheal intubation of a goiter with that's compressing the trachea. But there are some who don't do these and they get very uncomfortable and they wanna start doing fiber optic intubation. And I think there's some paper in the past that talks about fiber optic intubation in some of these patients. And my approach to these is that if they have no difficulty with their, their class one, two, three, you know, classification, if they don't have any, anticipate any difficulty with visualizing the vocal cords, I think it's probably best to do oral tracheal intubation um, and perhaps use a small tube if there's significant enough tracheal narrowing from the compression. And then once you start trying to do the fiber octane intubation, if the patient starts struggling a little bit and they, you know, hyperventilate, and then you get this sort of Bernoulli effect of the air sucking and, and uh, it just makes it more challenging. So, so that's one comment I want to make. And, and I think more importantly, you want to probably have um, a rigid bronchoscope sort of in the OR room right outside, just in case they can't pass a tube in and you could theoretically just try to pass a rigid bronch. I've never had to do that, but you know, it's, it's something that's good to have. Uh, as far as delivering the goiter such as this, I, I totally agree with you, Joe. I, I'd like to mobilize a superior pole, but I also divide the isthmus if I can, you know, if it's not like a big isthmus nodule. Uh, if I'm able to identify the isthmus, I'd like to divide it and then just go a little medial to lateral. And that just kind of gives me that sort of uh, 
narrower fulcrum to sort of move that goiter back and forth like this. And then I start basically sort of pulling gently, tugging um, from superior to inferior that goiter and actually starts sliding up. You know, it just gives you that sort of, that, that um, ability to just sort of pull superiorly a little bit, which then allows you to slowly mobilize bluntly uh, further inferiorly that just, and I just kind of work back and forth, but you're right, as you come around inferiorly on these goiters, you have to be very cognizant that the nerve could be sort of stuck behind the backside of this big goiter and, and don't divide anything. You know, the, the rule of thumb with, with my trainees is don't divide anything down there behind that goiter because that nerve could be right under there. You think it's a vessel, it's not. Um, and um, so that's just, you want, and, and at that point you definitely wanna identify you know, the nerve before you start dividing these vessels. And I think lastly, um, you know, I, I often will expose the vagus on this first, right off the bat to stimulate my, that my tube is actually in a great position, um, you know, because these nerves, you know, as you rotate, sometimes the tube sits there, but, but you know, as you're tugging on this rotation, it, it causes the position to change and, and you can occasionally intermittently lose signal and then you relax on that retraction and then you get the signal back, so. Joe, just to add to what Maisie said, I think, I think she makes a really good point in that the, the retrocenal goiters that worry me the most are when you've got a significant isthmic component pushing the trachea backwards. Mm -hmm. Because if you have that, you can't get that you lose a degree of rotation. Right. So then doing the isthmus exon or going through the isthmus right. enables you to bring that degree of rotation back into your operation. So you can again rotate it out immediately, whereas you can't if you've just got a big thick isthmus pushing everything backwards. If given the option of having all else being equal, right versus left side, do you prefer a right-sided as the nerve comes at a bit of a different angle off the subclavian, maybe not touching the gland as intimately as the left for these type of cases, or does it not matter? It, in my experience, you've got a higher risk of, I, I mean, again, going back to something Maid said earlier, with posterior mediastinal goiter, um, you've got a higher risk of the nerve going anterior to the goiter. And in my experience, that's happened more on the right side. Um, I don't know if that's because the right recurrent laryngeal nerve travels more lateral to the left because it's pulled out by the subclavian artery. Um, so I suppose if I was a, I had to choose, I'd probably go for a left. Um, I guess I go after the side that I think is causing more problem. Um, Oh yeah. <laughs> so, but I think that, you know, the tough ones are, uh, these are, you gotta, you have a very prominent tubercle of Zucker Kendall. And then as we all know, the nerve sort of dives under that. But then mm -hmm. if you have like this little sort of little tag of tissue that extends from the bottom part of that tubercle, you know, and, and then you have this retrosternal goiter that kind of goes medially and deep. That's where I think that nerve kind of comes on that right side from a, sort of a, obtuse angle and then just dips over that little tag. And that's where I think you can cut that nerve if okay. you're not thinking about that. Going back to the thick isthmus, I think a really useful thing to do in that scenario is dissect lat uh, laterally, but then also develop a plane between the trachea and the medial portion of the retrosternal goiter. So you can literally use both hands to start to free up the goiter and bring it up out of the chest. Right. Don't cut anything you can't see through. <laughs> That's my rule. Yeah. It, it's interesting after all these years of yep. right of education. It's don't cut anything red, white, or blue. And if you cut something, I guess cut the blue one. But <laughs> but not anything down there. You're right. You don't want to cut. We had a question also in the chat about tracheomalacia. Um, does it exist? Uh, have you? What are the panelists feeling about it? Or was it just a myth? The tracheomalacia? I, you know, I, I just, the anesthesiology colleagues are always worried about that at the time of the extubation. I, I don't know. I mean, I just have not seen that. <laughs> I've, I've never, seen, I've never seen it myself. We all know the tracheal. We all know the tracheal remodeling, uh, but that's not tracheomalacia. I, I I saw a case of tracheomalacia when I was a very junior doctor in Liverpool years and years and years ago. But as a thyroid surgeon, never seen it. Mm 
I've, I've often been curious that maybe at times there might be uh, unrecognized bilateral vocal cord neuropraxies and stuff that's made some anesthesiologists very worried over the years in these kind of cases. And maybe it was thought to be a tracheomalation when it wasn't misdiagnosed. I don't know. I haven't really seen it either. Yeah, I agree. So, so th thank you all. We, we have reached our time. We've had a great presentation and a great discussion, and I wish we could go on longer, but we really can't. So I'd like to thank Professor Tolley, uh, with Beats, uh, their leader, a longtime leader, uh, uh, being my uh, companion for this uh, webinar. I'd also like to thank Dr. Shindo in England for being discussant, and Drs. Russell and Saba and Dr. Scharf for uh, presenting their very interesting and intriguing cases. I'd like to thank all of our uh, audience for participating with the American Head and Neck uh, Society Endocrine Section and the British Association of Thyroid uh, Endocrine and Thyroid Surgeons today. We look forward to uh, your participation in our future webinars. Our future webinar um, schedule will be, will be produced soon and expect in the upcoming 22-23 biennium to see quarterly webinars from our section. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Good to see everybody. Be safe. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.